Okay, so in my continued efforts to try to shed light on what's going on at the kind of bottom of projective geometry and how such as these imaginary elements in geometry come about and what they mean, I've decided it's important to go back to some things that really lie at the core of the subject. In particular, the idea of one-dimensional projectivities. Projective geometry is all about how projections transform geometric objects and some of the simplest objects are lines. So we want to be thinking about what happens to a set of points on a line when we do a projectivity mapping that set of points to itself. And what we're going to find from doing this and from studying it using analytic geometry, in particular using homogeneous coordinates, what we're going to find is a very interesting idea cropping up and that is the idea of Mobius maps or so-called fractional linear mappings. They probably have quite some other names as well because they're extremely important in mathematics and physics. And so Mobius maps often occur in the context of complex analysis. One considers doing a Mobius mapping from the complex plane to itself. And we're going to see that same concept appear when we're thinking about projective geometry as well. However, in this lecture, I just want to go through the sort of theory of homogeneous coordinates in the projective plane in a fairly careful way, although not not absolutely rigorously. We're going to skip over a bit of reasoning, but in a fairly rigorous way we're going to go over this and basically see where the Mobius maps come about. So let's go. We're going to work on using homogeneous coordinates to represent points and lines in the plane. So we'll represent a point using round brackets and um, essentially it's given three coordinates little x1, little x2, little x3. Those are able to express what this point little x is. Now what kinds of numbers these are, whether they're rational numbers, real numbers, complex numbers, we're not going to specify. Suffice to say there can be any elements from a commutative field, there can be anything from a commutative field. Um, maybe it's best to think of them as real numbers for an initial kind of run over of the subject, although later we are going to be thinking of all of these things as potentially being complex numbers. So anyway, a point is written by three of these numbers x1, x2 and x3 and we don't allow them all to be zero and this refers to a, a point in the plane however it's important to realize that when we're talking about which point is geometrically represented by these coordinates the only thing that matters is the ratio between the three coordinates so little x1, little x2, little x3 refers to the same point as 2 times little x1, 2 times little x2, 2 times little x3. Multiplying the entries, the coordinate entries of a point by any non-zero constant gives an expression which refers to the same point because the only thing that matters is the ratios between the three entries of the coordinates and of course if we multiply them all by the same constant then that constant will get cancelled out when we consider the ratios. So that's basically the idea of the algebra, of the points at least, um, but what's the geometric interpretation? Well if we want to find an interpretation in terms of the Cartesian coordinates, the familiar x-y coordinates that we associate with the plane usually, we can do that. Provided that x3 is not equal to 0, we can interpret these 
homogeneous coordinates little x1, little x2, little x3 as the Cartesian coordinates where the x coordinate is given by little x1 over little x3 and the y coordinate is given by little x2 over little x3. So when x3 is not equal to 0 we can just divide through by x3 and then we can think of the first and the second entry of our homogeneous coordinates as representing the amount to the right and above the origin our point lies at. And um, this is the case when x3 is not equal to 0. When x3 is equal to 0, our homogeneous coordinates no longer refer to a point, a sort of finite point on the on the uh, on the plane. Instead, in that case, we can really think of it as being a point at infinity. And if you look at this algebra on the right, I mean, dividing by zero, in some sense, one might say gives an infinite answer. So when x three is equal to zero, we can interpret that as referring to a point at infinity. Now I just want to say that this is just a particular interpretation of homogeneous coordinates and in fact when we're thinking projectively we don't need to hang on to this sort of um, link between homogeneous coordinates and Cartesian coordinates. We can in fact think of um, think of these things in other ways. You can see my videos on homogeneous coordinates for more details of this. But this might help you to get a kind of geometric grasp of what, what we're talking about here. So that's about points. Now the other thing is lines. And just as in projective geometry, when we include the sort of potential for points at infinity, we see that points and lines basically end up being objects on kind of equal footing to each other and there's really a lot of symmetry between the properties they have and this can be seen very clearly in this theory of homogeneous coordinates because algebraically points and lines are treated almost identically so basically a point is three coordinate entries uh, encased in round brackets and a line is three coordinate entries encased in square brackets that's really the only difference between them just the sort of brackets we decide to use to represent them um, so here we have a, a line I'll typically use capital letters for lines here and this line is capital X and it has coordinates capital X1 capital X2 capital X3 so you might be wondering what what do the coordinates of a line mean how can this be interpreted? And the key to this, and in fact, the key to the whole idea of using homogeneous coordinates is this next statement, which tells us when a point and a line are going to be touching each other. In other words, when a point little x is going to be incident upon a line big X. And that's going to occur if and only if the dot product of the coordinates of the point and the coordinates of the line is equal to zero. This is also known as the scalar product. It's just the sum of the multiples of the entries of the coordinates of this point little x and this line big X. More specifically it's the it's the uh, entity little x1 times capital X1 plus little x2 times capital X2 plus little x3 times capital X3. So this is really the core of the theory of homogeneous coordinates and with this we can now give an interpretation of what a line is. Um, because essentially what, what this line corresponds to now is an equation um, of the form as is down here. Um, and this is an equation which basically tells us all the points which is on, which are on that line.
Okay then, so now let's talk a bit about some results of homogeneous coordinate theory. In particular, let's think about how we can express the set of all points which lie on the line through little y and little z. And so we have two claims which I'll try and um, substantiate as best I can in this short time. And the first is that the set of all points through y and z is the set of all uh, the set of all entities which can be expressed as lambda times y plus mu times z, where lambda and mu are any constants. And so the sort of set of all such expressions for different constants in whatever type of number system we're working in gives us um, all of the points on this line and nothing else. That's our sort of um, blue claim, if you like, and our red claim, which is something a little bit more specific, which we're going to use, is an expression for the line which actually goes through little y and little z. And so we're going to call this line L, or perhaps we'll call it L subscript YZ, just to be a bit more clear about what it means. And I claim that it can be written like this in terms of determinants. So in particular, the first entry of L is determinant Y2, Y3, Z2, Z3. The second entry is determinant Y1, Y3, Z1, Z3 times minus 1. And the third entry is determinant y1, y2, z1, z2. So just to remind you, the determinant a, b, c, d is just equal to the expression a, d take away b, c. So this is nothing more than a bit of shorthand for these um, kind of algebraic expressions. And so we can check that L does indeed um, touch point Y by looking at the dot product, the scalar product if you like, of the coordinates of Y, those being Y1, Y2, Y3, and, those, and the coordinates of L, those being the things I just uh, read out. And you can see them, you can see a sort of different way of writing L uh, down here. Whoops, excuse me. Yes, so you can see it here. I've uh, just expanded out these determinants. And so if we take a look at the uh, this dot product, then we can cancel out all the entries and see that it is in fact zero. So that's exactly the condition we want because it means that the point Y lies upon the line L. And similarly you can show that the point Z lies upon the line L by looking at these dot products. So this is a line, it has point Y on it and it has point Z on it. We're assuming point Y and Z are distinct. So there we have it. Now let's have a look at this blue claim that the set of all points on the line through little y and little z is the set of all points of the form lambda y plus mu z. Well, I can show that I'm showing here that all of these points of the form lambda y plus mu z are upon this line. But I haven't actually demonstrated that there aren't any other points on the line, or those are on. I just haven't gone through the full argument here, just a partial proof. So we're thinking about what are the conditions for an extra point to be on this line through Y and Z. Well, we know about this line now. We can call it L, and we have an expression for it up here. 
and um, so we can take these expressions of a form lambda y plus mu z and let's show that each of those such points actually lie upon this line L. So that's fairly easy. We can just use the kind of algebra of dot products. We can take these multiplying constants lambda and mu outside of the dot product and rewrite the dot product as lambda times dot product of y L plus mu times dot product of z L. And so that's going to be lambda times 0 plus mu times 0, which is 0 plus 0, which is 0. So yes, indeed, all of these points, um, which is something multiplied by y plus something else multiplied by z, each of those such points do lie upon L. I haven't shown the, uh, I haven't shown that there aren't any other points on L, but there are. I just haven't got around to proving that. So um, it's interesting actually if you, it's just um, a little bit of extra algebra, it's a bit of a tangent actually, but I'm going to go through it. So I like to write that a point X is going to be touching this line L using this little squiggly line here, but I think this is the only time I use it during this uh, lecture, so you don't need to worry about memorising that. But Anyway, this condition that point X lies upon line L, that's of course the same as that the dot product of X and L is zero. And you can show that that's equivalent to the fact that this determinant, this three by three determinant, X1, X2, X3, Y1, Y2, Y3, Z1, Z2, Z3 is zero. You can actually see that quite easily just by looking at this type of expression here where we just put in the explicit form of what L is and the explicit form of what the dot product of the point X with L is and it comes out as this exact expression. Now it turns out from the theory of determinants that this is this um, condition here is equivalent to the condition that there's going to exist constants kappa mu and nu such that kappa times x plus lambda times y plus mu times z is zero. So rewriting this um, to put x on one side we could say that x is equal to lambda y plus mu z divided by kappa. But the thing is that we can actually just forget about this kappa because that's an expression for x, I didn't write it down but I just said it and um, we can we can just get rid of the kappa from it because we're free to multiply our coordinates for x by any non-zero constant so um, basically by uh, what we can say is that the coordinates of x are proportional to lambda y plus mu z. So this is sort of an expression which is saying that um, these general points x upon this line L are going to be of this form uh, lambda y plus mu z. So okay let's move on. Um, we're going to think now about representing points on a line and um, this is a bit um, sort of it's a little bit more basic than the things I want to get into but it's important to go over because I think it it could get confusing if we don't sort of underline what's going on here so the important thing here is as I keep saying we're free to multiply an expression for a point by any non-zero constant and it gives an expression for the new point. So we use this trick over and over again to absorb constants into the expressions for points to simplify our algebraic expressions. So the general expression for a point um, x upon the line through y and z 
would be that x is equal to mu times y plus lambda times z. However, what we can do is we can rewrite z um, just by multiplying all of its entries by lambda. And um, that just sort of absorbs the lambda into the expression for z. And then we get this expression that x is equal to mu y plus z and so uh, in a sense any point upon the line can be written any point upon the line through y and z can be written as mu y plus z for an appropriate constant mu um, so if you think about it when when mu is zero this expression just gives us z However, how do we get x to equal y? What value of mu is appropriate there? Well, if we adopt the convention that when mu goes to infinity, this expression here is going to um, give us that x is equal to y, then we actually can refer to every single point um, upon the line through y and z by appropriately choosing the proper value of mu. So this is a lot simpler, right? Because we're just using one parameter to talk about the line instead of two. We can actually go even further, but we can only do it once in a sense. So we can, let's say we just have a single arbitrary extra point x, which is upon this line through y and z. Well, in that case, we can just sort of absorb this mu into y by rescaling y. And then we can just write that x is equal to y plus z. And we're fine to do this, but the issue is that the sort of coordinates for y have been specially selected so that this extra arbitrary point x can be written as y plus z. So if we have another point, say um, a, which is upon this line through y and z, then of course if a is going to be different to x, then it can't also be written as y plus z, because we've already sort of tailor selected y, so that it has this property that x is equal to y plus z. And we're going to have to write a is mu y plus z for some value of mu. So you can only kind of do this trick once for expressing one extra arbitrary point through y and z. Okay then, so that's basically the theory of points and lines and I suppose it's the theory of collinear points when points are upon the same line. and. How do we talk about them? How do we parameterize, parameterize a line and so forth? Now let's start, start to talk about projectivities. So what is a projectivity? A projectivity is basically a projection from a one-dimensional form to a one-dimensional form. So what's a one-dimensional form? Well, since we're just working in the projective plane, there's just two different kinds of one dimensional forms. There is a set of all points upon a line and the set of all lines for a point. And a projectivity is a map from one such 1D form to another. And it's a special kind of mapping. Um, and it's basically, we can define it as a mapping which can be created by doing a kind of composition of a sequence of mappings which are kind of simpler which we call elementary correspondences so basically we can think of a projectivity as a kind of transformation which we can obtain by repeatedly performing other transformations called elementary correspondences so what's an elementary correspondence well i've illustrated one here you see here we have this line L and we have this point P 
and we have all these green points upon this line L. Of course there's more. We can think of all of the points on the line L. And they're in elementary correspondence with these red lines that go through this point P. So we say that a point little y upon the line L is in elementary correspondence with the line capital Y which goes through the point P where capital Y is the point that we get, sorry, the line that we get by joining little y to little p. So to say it more simply, a point on L is going to be in elementary correspondence with the line we get by joining that point to P. Um, so P is sort of the carrier of all of these lines, all of these red lines, and L is the carrier of all of these green points. And we're doing an elementary correspondence from a set of green points touching L to a set of red lines touching P in such a way that a green point corresponds to the red line we get by joining that point to P. So it's a very simple idea. And a projectivity is just a kind of mapping from a one dimensional form to another one dimensional form that you can get by repeatedly doing these kind of elementary correspondences. So what I just was talking about was an elementary correspondence from a set of points on the line to the set of lines through the point. But we can turn that around and we still call that thing an elementary correspondence. So in just the same way, we have an elementary correspondence from a set of lines through P to the set of points on L in such a way that a line capital Y through P corresponds to the point little y where that line intersects with L. So like we have elementary correspondences from lines from a set of points on a line to a set of lines for a point and we have elementary correspondences from a set of lines for a point to a set of points on a line. And so you can imagine stringing together a sequence of these so you could say draw an extra line capital M above P and then you can see where all these lines through P are going to meet M and so then you've got an elementary correspondence from stuff touching L to stuff touching P to stuff touching M so that's like a sequence of elementary correspondences and that's basically exactly what a projectivity is it's just a transformation from a one dimensional form to a one dimensional form that's created by stringing together a sequence of elementary correspondences. So anyway, now we've uh, defined what a projectivity is, let's talk about how to represent them. So let's pick three arbitrary points upon this line L. We'll call them little y, little z, and little y plus little z. As I said, that little y plus little z can refer to any arbitrary third point upon the line, which is distinct from little y and little z. And um, so then we have this elementary correspondence. So we know little y is going to be correspond to capital Y, which is the line through little y and p. Um, little z is going to correspond to capital Z, which is the line through little z and little p. And little y plus little z is going to correspond to capital Y plus capital Z, which is the line through little y plus little z and p. Okay, so how can we then refer to this entire projectivity? Can we get a kind of algebraic expression for how it works across the whole line? Okay, this is a very simple projectivity, it's just an elementary correspondence, but once we've done the algebra here, it's very easy to generalize it. So let's do it. So we know that little y and capital Y are going to be touching each other. So their dot product is going to be zero. Similarly, the dot product of little z and capital Z is zero. And the dot product of little y plus little z uh, and big Y plus big Z is going to be zero. So we can expand out this expression for the dot product of little y plus little z and 
capital Y plus capital Z and this gives us a kind of important identity that we're going to use later so just expanding out this dot product and looking at what we already know and what we don't we get a bit of new information which is that the dot product of little y plus capital Z plus the dot product of little z plus capital Y that's a typo there so this should be a capital Y that I'm dragging this box around so this the sum of these two dot products should equal zero and we get this because we know that this entry is zero and we know that this entry is zero so we must have that this entry plus this entry is also zero since this whole thing is zero um, so okay now we know all that let's hazard a guess about what happens when um, we have a sort of generic point upon this line L which um, line through P is that going to correspond to well we can refer to that generic point as mu little y plus little z and I claim that that's going to correspond to the line mu capital Y plus capital Z so how can we prove this well let's just look at the dot product of these two entries so um, excuse me let's try and get this so it's not highlighting a million things okay um, so we want to look at the dot product then of mu little y plus little z and mu capital Y plus capital Z so just expanding this out we see it's going to be equal to mu squared times the dot product of little y capital Y well we know that's zero plus mu times the dot product of little y plus capital Z plus the dot product of little z times capital Y well we know that that's zero from what I was just talking about up here and we also have the dot product of little z and big z which is zero so indeed the dot product of these two things is zero so indeed this um, sort of general entry on the line through L this entry uh, mu y plus mu little y plus little z corresponds to the line mu capital Y plus capital Z through P okay so here's the important point when we repeat this argument over again so let's say we were doing as it's a thought experiment we draw an extra line above and then we sort of think about how these lines through P are going to correspond to points on that little extra line say the line capital M that we draw above well the algebra is going to be just the same and then if we add an extra point and we do another elementary correspondence and we do a whole chain of elementary correspondences the algebra is going to be just the same and we're always going to have that um, say if we're doing an elementary correspondence from points to lines um, sorry if we're doing a projectivity from points to lines as a sequence of elementary correspondences then we're always going to have that um, mu little y plus little z is going to correspond to mu capital Y plus capital Z um, so by repeating this argument if we have that little y little z and little y plus little z are only three points on a line and we have a projectivity sending them to capital Y capital Z and capital Y plus capital Z respectively then we can parameterize the whole projectivity from this um, set of points on a line to be set of lines for a point and crucially we're going to have the um, mu times little y plus little z is going to correspond to mu times capital Y plus capital Z for any value mu so this is going to work for any projectivity from a set of points on a line to a set of lines for a point so that's kind of one flavor of a projectivity but what about a projectivity from a line to a line well again just 
by repeating this sort of argument about the muse, we get that in general, and this is touching on some theory we also get from synthetic projective geometry, but in general we can sort of specify a projectivity from one line to another line by saying that a point little y gets mapped to a point uh, y dash, a point z gets mapped to a point z dash, a point y plus z gets mapped to a point y dash plus z dash. And given that information we can get a kind of general expression for a projectivity from the set of points on that line to itself. Uh, in particular that mu y plus z is going to be projectively mapped to uh, mu y dash plus z dash. I'm using this symbol here um, sort of like a wedge with a line on top. This is the usual symbol which means is projective to. Okay, So this is a kind of special symbol used in projective geometry. So what we're going to focus on is projectivities which go from the line to itself. And so as I was just saying we can think of those projectivities by saying well we're going to send y to y dash, we're going to send z to z dash and we're going to send y plus z to y dash plus z dash. And the fundamental theorem of projective geometry says that that's enough information to be able to fix the way the whole projectivity works. We don't actually have to rely on that theorem here. We get, we get that truth straight out of the algebra since we're working analytically. Um, and the truth we get is that in general the point mu times y plus z is going to correspond to the point mu times y dash plus z dash. So this is a kind of general expression for our one-dimensional projectivities. So this is basically the kind of uh, core of how we can think about these things analytically. That we specify them by saying we have a line, it has these six points on, and we're going to say that well, y is going to map to y dash, z to z dash, y plus z, to y dash plus z dash. And once we've fixed those three kinds of um, object to image pairs, the whole way that the projectivity works is fixed and it's parameterized by mu. So as we vary mu, we get a sort of initial point on the line and we know that that's going to be projectively mapped to the points mu y dash plus z dash. Okay, so there's really a lot to this idea of how we can kind of translate this kind of mapping from three points to three points on the same line into an entire projectivity. And what I would urge you to do is to think about how you would represent this in the kind of simplest way possible. So I told you at the beginning how we can um, think of these homogeneous coordinates as corresponding with Cartesian coordinates. So you can think about them as corresponding to points on the x-axis. And in that case how does this algebra correspond to a kind of concrete mapping of the x-axis to itself? Um, I urge you to go through that math and you'll have an interesting time dealing with these occurrences where we have to think about the proportionality of things and we have to scale things so that we can get proper Cartesian descriptions of these points. So that's kind of what I've done here and I've tried to make a sort of dynamic simulation of a projectivity from the line to itself. So here we have, uh, well we have three black points to begin with, three fixed black points, y, z and y plus z, three sort of distinct arbitrary points on this line. 
And we also have three blue points, Y dash, Z dash, and Y dash plus Z dash. And that basically defines our mapping. And then what I've done here is I've added an extra black point, which is of the form mu times Y plus Z. And um, I've sort of then worked out the point that that gets mapped to which is the point mu times y dash plus z dash and um, what I've done with this curve here is try to represent how this mapping is actually working so um, basically if you want to find out where mu times y plus z is going to get mapped to what you do is you um, look how how high above the point this blue curve is and that's the amount to the right that the image of mu times y plus z is going to be that's how far to the right this red arrow is going to be pointing so um, the curve basically just gives a way to represent how this mapping is working and I can animate this I'm going to move it up so you can see it properly so I'm just varying mu here and the black point kind of um, slides along as does its image and so there are fixed points of this mapping um, at the places where this blue curve meets the meets the line meets the x-axis because the curve is just representing displacement um, the completely vertical line of the blue curve that's not actually an intersect point that's a kind of connection between the asymptotes of this hyperbola um, so that's not actually a fixed point but the other things are and um, basically this is a kind of representation of what's going on so I urge you to think about how this was programmed and how you would go about sort of not necessarily programming such a thing but specifying all the coordinates in terms of Cartesian things as you need to do for putting things into a computer program like this. Okay, so we have this projectivity, this kind of general form for a projectivity, which is that mu y plus z is projective to mu times y dash plus z dash. So now what we're going to do is try and relate this to the idea of Mobius mappings. So what we've done here basically is said that we've got um, these six points on the line and that they're related by projectivity and then we get this expression for the projectivity but what and and we're using the same parameter mu to vary uh, um, about the kind of objects and the images but let's look at this in a different kind of way so I'm just gonna derive this without really warning you what's coming up because it's it's simpler this way so y dash and z dash are two sort of arbitrary points on this line so we can write them as y dash is equal to alpha times y plus gamma times z and z dash is equal to beta times y plus delta times z for arbitrary constants alpha beta gamma delta and then if we substitute that back in to our expression mu y dash plus z dash we get that that's going to be that's going to be equal to alpha mu y plus gamma mu z plus beta y plus delta z that's just a substitution and we can sort of sim we can write that in a simpler way um, we can write it as alpha mu plus beta all times y plus gamma mu plus delta all times z and the important thing here is that we're free to sort of scale this this is an expression for the point mu y dash plus z dash but if we multiply it by any 
non-zero constant, we also get an expression for that point. So this is going to be proportional to this expression here. Um, alpha mu plus beta divided by gamma mu plus delta times y plus z. So I use this kind of um, curly equal sign here to denote not that something's equal to something, but that it's proportional to it. Okay, um, so this is basically on an alternative expression for this point here that we're interested in talking about. So if we go back now to our expression with the red star, our expression for the general projectivity, we can just substitute this in. And so basically what we get here is that a general projectivity um, which is mapping this line through y and z to itself uh, by the way I write this line through y and z as y dot z um, so if we're doing a mapping of this line to itself then it's going to have this kind of general form that mu y plus z is going to be projective to alpha mu plus beta divided by gamma mu plus delta all times y plus z so um, this is very interesting now um, for people that have seen sort of Mobius maps before because you should recognize that if we look at what's happening to the y um, we've basically got a Mobius map here a Mobius mapping is something of the form mu goes to alpha mu plus beta divided by gamma mu plus delta where um, alpha beta gamma and delta are constants now um, typically you probably think of these things as being complex constants that's usually the way that Mobius maps um, will occur um, they often occur in complex analysis but that's fine because all of the things I've been talking about can all be applied in terms of um, in terms of complex fields so we could have thought of all of our expressions so far in terms of complex numbers and in fact that makes a lot of sense as I've argued in uh, previous lectures such as uh, the last one I was doing um, I think it was projectivities at the foundations of geometry or it was called something like that um, complex numbers are really almost it, they're almost suggested really just by looking at elementary geometry in my opinion um, it, it basically seems to make more sense to include them in the theory so um, in that sense probably if you're going to be thinking about um, homogeneous coordinates in terms of thinking about geometry you're probably best thinking in terms of them being complex things I'll talk about that more in the coming lectures but anyway basically we have Mobius map occurring here and um, just because I wanted to focus on Mobius mappings uh, I wanted to get a more kind of explicit appearance of Mobius map not just like oh if you look at the mu over here and this term over here this goes to this which is a Mobius map I wanted something more specific so I decided to focus on the x-axis so basically we've been talking about a line through these points little y and little z and um, we can have this line as the x-axis as is normally thought of in Cartesian coordinates and a nice simple way to do it is just to let um, y be the point with homogeneous coordinates 1 0 1 and z be the point with homogeneous coordinates 0 0 1 so what we could really say is that z is like the origin and y is like the point which is one unit to the right of the origin if we're thinking in terms of homogeneous coordinates so anyway let's go back to our um, expression green star here which is basically this kind of way of re-expressing our general projectivity in this kind of Mobius like mapping so just substituting in our um, suggested expressions for y and z here 
we get this equation here um, which I'm not going to read out but you can see it and um, basically if we now make a substitution so let's write mu 0 mu plus 1 this thing occurring on the left well let's just um, rescale this we'll divide it all by mu plus 1 so we can rewrite it or say it's proportional to mu star 0 1 where mu star is equal to mu divided by mu plus 1 and then with a bit of um, algebraic manipulation we can rewrite this term that occurs on the right here of this equation double green star as a times mu star plus b divided by c times mu star plus d comma zero comma one and here um, a b c and d could all be written in terms of alpha beta gamma and delta and they can basically be selected independently from each other so what we basically have here is precisely a Mobius mapping from a point on the x-axis to because basically if we look at this expression what's exactly happening is that mu star is going to a times mu star plus b all divided by c times mu star plus d so this is precisely the Mobius map appearing here so there are lots of interesting things to to do to carry on with this so for example I mean let's go back to this expression green star this is really the core of what's going on so a couple of questions uh, I'd like to pose to you is what are the fixed points of this projectivity okay so um, let's say we're working over complex numbers then each projectivity is going to have some fixed points some points which are projectively mapped to themselves what are they we can express them in terms of well we can find the values of mu or the exact expressions for the points which are mapped to themselves and when are they real and when are they complex you'll find that this happens uh, this this can be expressed in terms of these constants alpha beta gamma and delta so that's one thing another question is what happens if you sort of change the points of reference so this is an expression for a projectivity from a line to itself where we have these kind of two special points y and z um, but what about if we pick two other special two other points um, y star and z star and we have the same projectivity but we express it as some constant mu hash times y star plus z star is mapped to something times y star plus z star then how what's the algebraic expression then what happens if we sort of change the points of reference which we're referring to instead of describing the projectivity in terms of y and z we describe it in terms of y star and z star so that's another interesting question to look at so next time I intend to look at how this stuff relates to the theory of involutions and then we're going to get towards how all this stuff relates to expressions for complex points and complex lines in geometry and I'm going to um, focus in upon something which I talked a bit about in the last lecture which is about a kind of um, interpretation for complex points um, in geometry which is basically a kind of it's it's coming from von Stout it's, it's um, representing complex points in terms of involutions and so that's basically a pure geometric idea but it's kind of hard to understand in a pure geometric terms and so what we're going to do once we've use these ideas to think about involutions is we're going to use that algebra to think more clearly about how involutions can be used to represent imaginary elements in geometry